All right, thank you, Ishi. Uh, guys, welcome. Good morning. I, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Pedro Delgado. Uh, for those of you who do, I am uh, very sorry uh, <laughs> you are stuck with me this morning. No, no, you deserve better. But listen, I I'm excited to be here with you guys. I really am. I'm bummed though because we were this close from like being able to see each other in person. Like I, I, I don't know if you know, you might recognize this beautiful house I'm in. Thank you so much, Hilda. Thank you, Romans, for letting me stay here. I'm in New Jersey. Like I, I came here to see you guys. Like I was so fired up about giving you guys in-person air hugs. I don't know if that makes sense. You know what I'm saying? Like I just, I was looking forward to seeing all of you guys at the park, but it's not meant to be. It's okay. That just means I got to come back sooner. Right. I just got to come back sooner when it's hopefully it's not raining and, and, and we'll see each other. But anyways, like I said, I'm ex excited to be here. Happy Memorial Day weekend to everybody. Uh, you know, I, I uh, this is just a time, a weekend where we're like called to just remember those who uh, gave the ultimate sacrifice uh, for us to be able to live in a place where we can try to better ourselves. Right. Does that make sense? And I think that's what I want to do this morning, that's what I want to talk about. How can we clear a way, make a path so that we can better ourselves uh, and, and change? You know, I want you guys to think about it in this way, right? Have you ever prepared? Is there an event in your life that you prepared for? I, I don't know. I just, just take a moment to think about it. I know there's probably a lot of teens. Um, I'm, I'm going to start scrolling and see if I see anybody that are seniors right now. Right, you, got, you guys have probably been preparing for a long time for this exact moment to graduate. You probably put in applications, uh, you know, back in uh, last year sometime. Uh, you know, you've been kind of getting all the, you know, cap and gown and pictures and all, those, all that stuff ready. You know, I, I, I don't know, parents, you're probably like thinking, oh my gosh, we've been working until this moment for a very long time. You might be moving soon. I, I don't know what it is. But man, did it take a lot of preparation, right? Same thing with moving. Somebody put in my wedding. Yes, it takes a lot of preparation, especially moving with kids. Have you guys ever, for those of you who have kids, it's just insane having to, to do all that. Certainly whenever, you know, it, it, moving is just a challenge all within itself, but it's just another thing when you have uh, kids. But it just feels like anytime change is going to happen, preparation is needed. I think this is what we see in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 to 5. I love that Johnny shared Isaiah 40 scripture as well. I'm going to read that at the end just because I think it connects so well with the service. I love when God does that. But Isaiah 43 to 5 says this, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for God. Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain and the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all the people will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You know, in Isaiah's time, if a king or a dignitary was going to visit the place, the place was prepared. The roads were prepared. The, uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, any obstacles that were, were in the way were removed. I believe this scripture in a similar way is telling us that if we want to connect with God, if we want to allow him to be able to come into our lives and, and to continue to, to, to grow and to change, which is what we all want, we have to eliminate barriers. We have to repair relationships, right? I, I know there's just something that, especially during this time that, that I've been personally battling with, I'm just going to keep it real here with you guys a lot uh, uh, as well. You know, it's so easy for me, especially subconsciously to fall into is a big word I'm going to throw out there, but, but hatred and bitterness. There's just so, much, so many things going on in the world, and it's, it's so easy now to, to, to watch them, and, and so many things are much more exposed because of technology. But if we're not careful, like we, that can become a barrier that stops us from being able to connect with God, you know, because of uh, the racism and the violence and all of the stuff that we're seeing out there. Like it's just, it, be, it can become so easy you know, especially subconsciously to, for those barriers to go up, you know, and, and these relationships with other people, it's just, just something that we have to be careful for, because if we do not remove them, we will not be able to connect with God. I, ho I hope that makes sense. You know, we have to remove distractions as well. Idols. What, what is it that we're putting before God? Any fears that we might have? If you haven't already picked up on it, 
my first point is that you have to prepare the way. You have to prepare the way. If you want to be able to connect with God, if you want to be able to have a relationship with him, you have a role in it. It begins with you prepare the way. Matthew 3, uh, 7 to 10, the original way prepare. I don't know if that makes sense. But anyways, the, <laughs> the OG John says this in verse 7. But when he saw so many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance and do not think that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Man, this man seems angry. It seems he seems very upset. Listen, you'd probably be upset too if your breakfast was uh, grasshoppers and honey, but, but that's beside the point. I think what's going on here is that he's trying to tell people, listen, you have to be ready. Jesus is coming. Like, if you want to have a relationship with him, you have to remove the obstacles. That is the point of this uh, of scripture. You want to connect with Jesus, you have to remove the obstacles, get rid of the junk. There's stuff in the way. Unless you clear room for God, there's not going to be any room for him. So the obvious next question is, is uh, uh, that we need to be asking ourselves is how do you do that? How do you do that? Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse five. I know I'm throwing a bunch of scriptures at you. I'll try to, uh, you know, keep repeating them. Second Corinthians 13, verse five says this, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Clear the path. He is coming. He is going to be in there with you, but you have to make room for him. See, that's one of the most incredible things about God. And to me, one of the most special things about Christianity is that God doesn't want to force you into a relationship with him. Like he, he values giving you the, the ability to choose. He wants you to, to have a choice. That's the only way we can have an incredible relationship with him. Otherwise, we'd be robots. We'd be like a tree. We'd be like an animal you know, who has no, no, no ability to choose for themselves. And he's like, you get to choose if you want a relationship with me, but I'm going to be here. But if you're going to have a relationship with me, you have to clear the way for me. See, an unexamined Christian life is like an unattended garden. If you let your garden go unattended for a few months, you won't have roses or tomatoes anymore, but a bunch of weeds. Mm -hmm. right? An unexamined Christian life is like an unkept house. Like you can, you can clean it up, all you want, lock it up as tight as you want. But if you leave for some time and then come back, you're going to find dust. You're going to be like, where did this dust come from? Like, it's just there. Things sneak in if you're not continuously a self-examining. We have to examine our lives, continue uh, to, to test ourselves, to see where you're at, because these barriers, they sneak in whether you, whether you know it or not. And that's why earlier when I was talking about some of the things that I, I've struggled with, I, it's subconscious. It's subconscious. I know that because I, I don't think anybody in here would say, oh, I, I, I hate this person or, or I'm just so bitter against you. But it, it, that, just like dust, it sneaks into your hearts. And if you're not constantly trying to figure out, okay, what is it that is getting in the way? You, it can really affect you and your relationship with him. You, listen, this, this self-analyzing thing, it's, it's so biblical. It's so spiritual. It's a common theme. God himself did it. I'm not sure he needed to do it, right? But, but he certainly gave us the example in it. I mean, you look at the creation story and what happens? God creating all along the way. He kind of stops and he's like, he sees man. And what does he say? It's not good for him to be alone. He's analyzing. He's self-examining. He said, okay, well, what did I do here? What example can I give? Again, I'm not sure he needed to do it, but he's certainly leaving an example for us to be able to say, okay, what is it that I constantly need to be doing? Psalm 139, 23 to 24 says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offense, weigh in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We have to continuously, constantly be self-examining ourselves to see where it is that we're at, to see if there's any barriers, to see if we need to clear the way, clear a path for God to be able to come in to our hearts. I hope, I hope that makes sense. So 
So the next thing you need to be asking yourself, okay, Pedro, that sounds all, that sounds great, but how do I go about doing this stuff, right? Okay, you, you're talking about finding barriers. Okay, you got You said you got to self-examine. Okay, that's great. Okay, well, how do you self-examine? How do you evaluate? How do you analyze, you know, what's going on when you're like, well, here's the thing. I think it's very different for everybody. I'm certainly going to share some of the things that I do to, to evaluate myself and to see, you know, where I'm at spiritually. But I think that's something that you personally will be able to know and the people around you who know you well are going to be able to help you with to try to figure out, okay, how can I figure out where I'm at mentally, spiritually, you know, emotionally? How, how can I figure that out? For me, I really believe that this self-examination has to be, there's two categories of it. I think the first one is like a daily reflection. Uh, every day, honestly, several times a day, you kind of kind of have to do a self-examination. You do every day. You just get, you just have to. In the world that we live in, it's imperfect. Like you just have to. The first one, now they tend to be a little more shallow when you're doing them every day. And that's fine. You can't have the deep, profound ones every day. I mean, that's just, there's just no time for that. You wouldn't be able to live in this world. But every day you wake up, you have quiet times and you ask yourself, okay, how does this scripture apply to me? Like, how can I become more like what the scripture is saying? How do I apply? How, in what ways is the scripture pointing me to Jesus? Like, there's ways that you can ask yourself, hey, how do I do this? Sometimes you have to self-evaluate when you're in a car and you're stuck in traffic and you're like, you know, somebody cuts you off and you're like, okay, stop. stop, stop. All right, Jesus, where's my heart at right now? Okay, that, I, I, that word is not, a, the, I don't want to say that word out loud. That's just not, I shouldn't react like this. That's a self-evaluation. That's great. You know, when you're, when you're needing to have a tough conversation with Jesus, take the wheel. That's right. Put the song on. Put the song on if that helps. All right. I, I don't know. Good, good stuff, Dania. Uh, you know, I, there's just different, there's different times. You need to have a tough conversation with a boss. You need to have a tough conversation with a friend. There's a, there's a, okay, where's my heart at? Especially if you're having tough conversations with your friends. Why am I bringing this to their attention? Like, is there a so selfish motive in me wanting to correct them? Is there a selfish motive in me wanting to teach them? Is there a selfish, like that self, you know, uh, analysis. That's like, okay, do I love this person? And is that the reason why I'm trying to, to bring this stuff to their attention? Or is it something that I want to return? Ask yourself that. And if, if you have the right motives, I promise you, you will be, you will go in the right direction. Hope that makes sense. I also believe though, that there's a time for much deeper, profound reflection. Okay, and, and I really try to go to this whenever I'm feeling burnt out, whenever I don't feel fulfilled in life, you know, whenever I'm starting to be bored in my Christianity. And I just can be honest with you, sometimes I, I get bored and Christianity is not boring, I promise you. So if, if you're feeling like a little bored in your Christian life, then it's likely because there's, there's something wrong. You're disconnected. You're, there, there's, there, you're not, you know, uh, you, you're just not connected in the way that you need to be. There's barriers. Something's up. Because I promise you the way that the Christianity that Jesus calls us to live is not born. And, and I, I, want, I tend to do these deeper reflections whenever I, um, I, you know, I get robotic in my spirituality, when I, I'm just kind of going through the motions. All right. Now, I'm going to share with you guys some questions that I ask myself, uh, you know, and, and I changed them a little bit for you guys. So I ask myself a version of this. Um, you know, uh, as well, I, I try to take a weekend sometimes when I'm feeling this and, and sometimes I'll just go through one or two questions at a time and I'll take a piece of paper and I just write answers to that. And, and they're so helpful for me. They might be helpful for you. Great. If they're not, that's great too. I'm going to go through them kind of fast. So I just uploaded a document into the, the, uh, work to the comment section here, the self-assessment questions. If you want to download that for yourself and, and kind of look at them later on, totally up to you. Uh, you know, uh, if, uh, Effie, if you need me to translate them, I will gladly do that as well. You know, I don't have them in Spanish, but I will, I'll probably be a good idea to have them considering I, I help lead a Spanish ministry. So I, I can, I can certainly, I can certainly do that, uh, as well, but I want to go through some of these questions with you guys, because I think, uh, it could be, it could just be helpful. All right. First question that I kind of tried to have reflect on is what do you give to God financially? Now, if you're visiting, let me tell you, I don't, there's no connection that I have to this church that I'm preaching at right now. I'm not getting paid. Like, I don't, I don't work for them, okay? This, and I'm not even talking about tithe, necessarily. I'm talking about giving to people. Like, since actions speak louder than words, like we need to take a look at our financial giving to the people around us, to our communities, to our church. 
If you're honest today, what would you say that you're giving re reveals about your love for God? All right. What do you do with your time? Do you make spending time with God a top priority in your life? Or do you complain that you don't have time to pray or read the Bible, yet you somehow make lots of time to visit friends, watch television, get on Netflix, be on social media, post every day? If God looked at your life and measured what you love most by the things you dedicate your time to, what would he say? All right. What do you do to serve others? I, I feel like somebody's having trouble with the link. Crystal, I will, uh, I will put it up here after I read the, uh, the, uh, the questions here. I'll try to load it up again. What do you do to serve others? It's amazing how many people claim to love God, but never have time to serve him in a practical way in your community mm -hmm. or in your church. All right. And this is important for me because, you know, I work, I work for the church. I work for the Boston church. And so it's like, I, I got to make sure that I'm, I'm serving God because I want to serve God. And there's times where I'm serving that's outside of my work. Does that make sense? That's that, that just for me. This is one that I reflect on a lot. By looking at your life, would God say that your actions prove that you're more devoted to your own needs and interests or that your life demonstrates that you are in love with God's church? All right. Now, I love doing this reflection and trying to think about what God might be thinking. The reason I say that is because, you know, I, I uh, I'm very good at arguing with myself. I tend to win the arguments that I have with myself. I don't know if you guys uh, can relate to that, right? I win 100% of the arguments that I have with myself. So I could easily deceive myself if I'm thinking like, Pedro, you're doing all right, Pedro. Like, come on now, like you're doing okay. But when you put yourself in God, it's like, what would God say about your, it just tends to convict you a little bit more, right? It's like God's in the room, God's watching. There's nothing you can hide. What would he say? about these things. It just challenges me a little bit more. I don't know if it'd be the same for you. When you pray, what do you pray about? Do you pray about yourself only? Or do you pray for the needs of others? It's easy to think of yourself and, and your desires. How often do you focus, you know, on prayers for the concerns of others, you know, about others' dreams, about others, uh, you know, desires? How concerned are you? What would God say about how concerned you are with others? What personal sacrifices do you make when you serve God? How long has it been since you gave up something or changed your schedule to help someone else or, or just changed your schedule to obey God's plan? Can you honestly say that you're picking up your cross and dying to your own interest in order to serve others? If God opened the, up his book to reveal the sacrifices you have made for him or others, would the record reveal that you're, you care deeply of God and you live in obedience to his commands or would it show that you are unwilling to inconvenience your life in any way or sacrifice any of your private plans for him? What do your spending habits reveal? Well, you know, it just, there's just so much here now we don't have to kind of go through everything, but do you see how this is a much deeper, deeper self analysis than the simple like waking up in the morning, you know, reading scriptures and, and being like, okay, how can I apply this to my life right now? In what ways you know, can I, can I reflect this? Like th th there's just this deeper, deeper analysis that has to take place. And I think it's so biblical. And, and I think it's, it's good. It's good for us to do. God wants you to do it because he knows the ruts that we could get into. And he knows that uh, if, if, if we're not active and intentional in our lives, that dust is going to sneak in, even though you think your house is clean, even though you think it's on lockdown. You guys see what I'm saying there? Get out of your own way so God can have his way. There's no other story where this idea really comes into play to me, where there's no other case study. I love, you guys know, you've heard me preach before. I love like being able to see what God teaches you in the scripture and then seeing examples of that in the scripture. And I feel like this comes into play so clearly in the story of, of the Israelites trying to get into the promised land. Now, you guys remember Moses you get to the cross, they get, they get to the edge, the, the border, and they're about to go in. Moses sends out spies, and what happens? Who come back fired up just like God described it, just like he said it was going to look like, exactly what we were expecting, and 10 are like, no. Like, we look like ants in our own eyes. These dudes are giants. They're going to destroy us, right? You have to, I know what God said, but no. What, what happened? The, the barrier of fear got in the way, 
and they didn't allow God in, even though God had told them this is what needs to happen. And so they, they, you know, they, they uh, pushed them away in that sense. But then years later, we get to Joshua chapter two generations, a generation later, chapter spies are sent out again. And in verse eight, this is what happens. Before the, the spies laid down for the night, she went up on the roof. And this is talking about Rahab, one of the, the people who actually lived in one of these uh, cities. Before the spies laid down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did, Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, when you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven, above and on earth below. How do you think these two spies must have felt? I mean, it must have been unbelievable for them, unfathomable. They must have been speechless, like, what? We were the ones that were scared. You don't understand what it took us. People have died because we were so scared, because there was a barrier that was getting in the way of our relationship with God, because we just did not trust him. And you're telling me that all along you guys have been scared of us, that you giants, right? Like making us feel like ants in our own eyes. You are trembling that you have heard of the things that God has done. God has already created these, uh, you know, acts for us to complete. We're, we're, we're you know, we're, we're his special possessions from, from before even a time itself. Like he's had a plan for all of us. All his, our path has been laid. We really just need to allow him in so that he can come in and do what he has to do. It, it, it's crazy. It's just, it's, it's sad. Same time, funny how we build walls, create roadblocks, barriers, and restrictive rules that have the potential to get in the way of our blessings, of our relationship with God. Sometimes we, we, we tend to make mountains out of molehills and convince ourselves that we're facing huge obstacles when, in fact, we only perceive things that way. We need to get out of our own way. The problem isn't that major. The challenge isn't that great. The opposition isn't that strong. The hurdle isn't that high. The gap isn't that wide. The chances are not that slim. We only believe they are. So we stress ourselves out unnecessarily and worry needlessly instead of trusting God's plan. If you had just trusted, if they had just trusted, I'm sorry, those two spies must have thought, right? If, 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 if you had just, we, we would have avoided all those generations that didn't get to make it if you had just trusted God and trusted his plan. Mm -hmm. You had just trusted. You know, I, I, I absolutely loved uh, Susie's communion. Mm -hmm. First of all, Susie, we are so proud of you. We are, you know, I, I posted on here that uh, I can't, I, it feels like yesterday that you were a little scarlet fish, right, right, a little scarlet fish. And now you graduated and you got into grad school, congratulations. And just to hear you, you know, we, we've been there with you. Like we, we've heard, like my wife, you know, has, has, has you know, gone back and forth with you and, and heard you say, I just, I want to be more connected in this way. And then now to be able to see you talking about that was just so moving for me. Uh, this morning, and I'm so grateful that I got to be here to hear it. And that's exactly what this self-analysis, this self-examination is supposed to lead you to. You know, here's the key, here's the secret. Everything is just supposed to lead you to getting to know Jesus a little bit better. Getting to be able to connect with him a little more and see him for who he really is. Proverbs 3 verse 6 says, in all your ways, submit to him or acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. When you see him for who he is, for his grace, for his power, he makes your path straight. Right? Psalms 44, verse, uh, verses 2 to 3. With your hand, you drove out the nations and planted our ancestors. You crushed the peoples and made our ancestors flourish. It was not by their sword that they won the land, nor did their arm bring them victory. It was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your face, for you loved them. I love how... You know, David is like talking about his ancestors. He said, look at the people of the past. Look what those spiritual soldiers did. How uh, perfect 
right? Uh, uh, this scripture is really in light of the weekend that we're celebrating, Memorial Day weekend, where we're, where we, it's a, it's a, you know, holiday to remember how those in the past paid the ultimate price. Spiritually, we can do the same. In fact, look at the ancestors. Look what they did. Look how they flourished. Not because, it, not because of their strength, because of their sword. It was because of you. It was because of your right hand. This scripture <laughs> reminds me a lot of the crossing guards for some reason. I know it's, it's going to be maybe extreme. I'm a dad, remember. Uh, the crossing guards at my, at my son's school. Right? I, I just picture that in that way. He's, he's, he's seven years old. He's in elementary. But every, you know, every day we go pick them up and we see these crossing guards look like they look like giants with little ants all around them. And they walk and they get, put themselves in front of the car. And they, they just kind of clear a path for all these little first graders and kindergartners to walk by. And I just I picture God doing that for us. And he, he's out there and he's stopping stuff. And he's like, listen, I, I'm going to clear a path for you to walk. Just trust me. And you can go. Now, if you get out of that path and you decide to run, listen, I'm not going to I'm not going to force you down. But, but I, I do have a way for you to be able to connect with me and have an incredible relationship with me. And so that I can bring you peace no matter what's going on. So you can have joy no matter, you know, the, the crazy things that are going on around you. You just trust me. You know, we, we entertain doubt and dismiss the promises of God because they seem unlikely to happen. Because we don't really have the right perception of who he is. We don't, we don't know how powerful he is. We don't know, we, we don't realize, you know, how... How in control he is. That's why Sarah laughed in disbelief in Genesis 18 when God promised that she would give birth. That's why to a son. That's why Gideon asked God for a bunch of confirming signs in Judges 6 when the Lord said he would lead the Israelites to victory over uh, the Midianites who you know, seemed like they were unbeatable. That's why Moses kept arguing with God in Exodus 4, you know, and coming up with all these excuses as to why he was unfit to deliver the Israelites from Egyptian servitude. In every case mentioned, they needed to get out of their own way, clear a path. And when they finally did, each of these individuals were successful in carrying out the will of God, in carrying out the will of God. I think that's kind of where we get caught up sometimes, right? We're unsure if what God wants is ultimately what's best for us. It's, it's a control thing. We need to get out of our own way and trust. The Lord was faithful to fulfill his promises. He is. He has already equipped us and he has already equipped them. They were chosen. We are chosen. They were chosen despite their situations. We are chosen despite ours. You know, I read John earlier, like I said, the original OG, the dude that that was the first, uh, uh, you know, clear of paths for Jesus. And uh, in uh, Matthew 3, 11 to 12, he says this, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Again, he, he seems a little grumpy, but put yourself in his shoes. I mean, this man is wearing leather for a jacket. Nevertheless, the road, the map that he lays out is perfect for us when it comes to getting to know who he is, who Jesus is. What does he do? He points them to Jesus' power. He's like, this is someone who's more powerful than I am. Jesus is someone, he says, who is so regal, who, who, who is just so sovereign. I'm not even like, I can't, I'm not even worthy enough to undo his sandals. Now, if you didn't know, right, to, to, to the Israelites, it, the feet were like a disgusting thing. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing, summarizing here, but, but they were. They walked all over the place. They wore sandals. Like it was, it was not a good thing for someone to be like not worthy of you know, touching feet like that, that. That was just, that's just gross nowadays. And we wear socks and shoes, let alone just walking all day, you know, you know, almost barefooted. Right. And, and he's like, I'm not even worthy of that. This is how majestic Jesus is. We forget that sometimes. And that's why I tell you this self-analysis, this self-examination, Susie's example, all is supposed to lead you to this. How can, what do I need to do right now in my life to be able to get to know him for who he is, get to know him more. Now, for the young disciple, that might, that might mean like you need to memorize scripture a little more. You need to uh, be just, just con like really be uh, setting a good foundation for yourself. For the older disciple who's been 10, 20, 30 years, it might be something much different. You might need to spend more time outside. You might need to be fasting for a lot longer. I, it, how we connect with him is going to be different. It's going to be changing. That's why analysis, assessment is so 
important. We have to get out of all, you have to get out of your own way so God can have his way. I'll close out with Isaiah 40, verse 28, what Johnny read. I thought it was perfect. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. I love you guys. Thank you so much. If you guys would mind uh, praying with me uh, to close out uh, my portion of the service, that would be incredible. incredible. Father, uh, we come to you and I'm incredibly grateful uh, to be here with my family. I'm so thankful for fellowship. I'm so thankful that you promise us uh, that you will give us a family. You will give us bigger family. My family is so far there in Texas, God, and it's just so good to feel like I'm around people that are close enough for me to be able to come visit. I wish I could see them in person, but, but this is good enough for today. I pray that you be with each one of them. As they, uh, continue, Father, to uh, search uh, for, the, for, to, for a closer relationship with you, God. I pray that you uh, continue to help them to engage and, and be intentional about their spiritual walks and assess, God, exactly where it is that they're at spiritually. I love you, God, so much. It's an honor to be able to worship you. You are a sovereign God. You are all-powerful. You know everything, and yet you love us and show, show us compassion. In your sense,